Good morning. Good morning. Wow, it got quiet all of a sudden. It's good to have you with us this morning. Welcome you to Grace Bible Church. There are so many different things that are going on here right now. The best thing for you to do is to look at our website, gbcelm.org, and you'll get updates on all of the different events. One of the things in particular in the next couple weeks is going to be the Iwana program starting up again. And uh, as you can tell, there's some people excited about it. So you can get all the details uh, on our website. You can check us out on the different uh, platforms, the media, social media platforms as well. We want to encourage you to, uh, to remember that as we come together, we worship the Lord with our music, with our hearts. We also, also worship him with our giving. And so that we don't take up time doing that in the service, there are boxes outside that you can make use of in the hall or do it online. We appreciate your generosity. You know, one of my responsibilities as an elder is handling the benevolent fund. And I'm just amazed at the continual support that we receive, even though we don't even mention it uh, for the most part. And the blessing it is when we get a chance to, uh, to help somebody that's in need. So thank you for that. Let's take this time and go before the Lord in prayer and start our service together before him. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your loving kindness. Thank you for the mercy that you've shown us. For giving us salvation. For giving us the opportunity to get together for fellowship, to meet freely without any kind of fear or any kind of concerns at all. Thank you for each one that's here, for your provision for them. And Lord, we know that this weekend is a time where we, we celebrate uh, our ability to work. The strengths that you've given us, the jobs that you've given us, the, uh, the way that you don't want us to be idle, but you want us to be serving you and looking for those opportunities every moment. Father, as we gather together as a body, we pray that we might sense your presence here, that we might feel your Holy Spirit speaking to us, and that we might be obey, obedient, obedient in all things. Thank you for our pastor. Thank you for those that lead the music. And thank you, Lord, that we get to come boldly before you. We ask that this time would be pleasing. It would be a sacrifice that would be acceptable to you. Father, we're going to commemorate this morning the crucifixion, the gift that was given on our behalf, the shedding of blood for the forgiveness of all our, our sins. But Lord, we know it didn't end there because three days later, our Savior rose and he reigns on high He's seated at your right hand. And Lord, we, we just pray that we'll celebrate these gifts that you've given. Lord, just use this time to bring your name, honor, and glory, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Would you stand and sing with us today?
You guys can have a seat. And at this time, um, I'd like to dismiss the kids from five years old. So that's five years old to fifth grade for Kingdom Kids Celebrate. And if that's you, um, they can be picked up in rooms 230 and 232 after the service. Thank you. I once knew this woman who would wear a wedding ring, but I knew she wasn't married. And I asked her one time, I said, why is it that you wear that wedding ring? She says, well, I'm married to Jesus. This is before I was a believer. I thought, that's weird. That's weird. I don't know about, oh, she's one of those. I remember thinking that, oh, she's one of those. You know, it's interesting because certain orders in Catholicism and other branches and expressions of Christianity do that. They wear wedding rings to signify the fact that they are wedded to God, to Christ. It's something like, uh, like a purity ring, a promise to be faithful, a reminder of what it means to be engaged and, and, and married to the God that we serve. But if you look at the scripture, it's not that any single one of us are actually engaged or married to God. It's the church as a whole. And that's what we're talking about these past several weeks in our series on the church and the, the metaphors that God uses and the writers in the scripture to describe us. We've talked about the body of Christ and how each of us belong to one another. We've talked about the building and how we need to take care as a church, as a family, to build upon the foundation of Christ well. Next week, we'll talk about the flock. Wayne will be here to deliver a message. We're so grateful for that. And then the week after that, we'll talk about the branches, the speaking of the vine, the true vine, the gardener and the vine dresser, and how we as a church can produce fruit for the kingdom of God. You see, the church, us, we are the bride of Christ, and therefore we must be ready for the day of our heavenly marriage. This is important because how we understand ourselves, how do we view ourselves in light of the rest of the world, in light of our responsibilities one to another, in light of our responsibilities to God, matters. No one would ever think that they could get married to someone and then go off and do whatever they want. Certainly not somebody who's in a godly, faithful marriage. But if it's true that the church is the bride of Christ, there come certain rights and responsibilities with that. And God is calling us to be faithful, and so we should. There's several passages today that we're going to go through that relate this truth, but we're going to touch on two to start. So if you have your Bibles, you can open them up to 2 Corinthians. Otherwise, it will be up here on the screen as well. The first is 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. It's just one verse, and this is Paul writing to the, uh, the people in the church of Corinth, and he says, let me, let me sort of set it up. So there were people coming into the church with a different view of what the true gospel was, and they were getting distracted by other things. They were succumbing to idolatry in their life. And Paul says this, he says, For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed, we're going to talk about that word, since I betrothed you to one husband, to present you as a pure virgin 
to Christ. Paul is saying that I came and I cared for you. I brought the gospel. I loved you. I told you who you were. I told you who God says you are. And now that I'm not there, you're being distracted by other things. And so he felt this divine jealousy. You know, I kind of feel this jealousy for you guys as well from time to time. When I hear somebody in your life or something in your life or some distraction in your life that's pulling you away from the truth of the gospel, the truth of Jesus Christ in your life and his power and his ability to provide everything you need. Sometimes we get distracted and we look to the things of the world and where we're to be faithful to Christ, we become faithful to something else. And in the end, it comes back to hurt us. So 2 Corinthians 11. This talks about the word, this says the word betrothed. And I think it's important for us, this is an older term. Certainly many of the uh, youngest among us would not know what this term means, but it's like a binding engagement. So imagine it like this. The, the dating world today has got it all messed up. <laughs> it's all messed up. Today, you like someone, you ask them on a date, you go on a date, you kind of just hang out. That's, what, that's like the famous phrase. So what's going on? I don't know. We're just hanging out. Then they begin to date. They go to so many dinners. Then they advance next to engagement. Then they get married. Okay? The truth is, is during this time that this was written, betrothal was something different. What would happen is, is that someone would go to the woman, get engaged, and once they were engaged, it was like a binding agreement. In some ways, they were already married. As we're going to see, they actually carry some of the rights and responsibilities of the person to whom they're betrothed. This betrothal could only be severed by divorce. This explains why in uh, in the New Testament, when Joseph finds out that Mary is pregnant, and he knows he wasn't there, he assumes that she was unfaithful, and so even though they were not properly married and only betrothed, he was going to seek a divorce. And then the angel came and told him not to do it. So betrothal and engagement during this time is very, very important, and we need to understand that. So the first passage, 2 Corinthians, second passage is Ephesians 5, 25 through 32, which says this, talking about human marriage, but it relates it to the gospel and to Jesus Christ. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, Paul says, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. So in some way, our human understanding of marriage here on earth is a mirror of the truth, of the the heavenly truth that Christ is our husband and we are his betrothed as his church. That's the first lesson for this morning we need to know. The church is betrothed to Christ. We are engaged in a binding agreement with Christ. This is not a New Testament idea. This is not something that we've not read in the Bible before. In fact, the Old Testament talks about it. The Old Testament alludes to the marriage metaphor actually quite often. Jeremiah 3.14, this is what he says to the people. Return, faithless people, declares the Lord, for I am your husband. I mean, that's pretty blatant. I am your husband. In the book of Amos, God, through the prophet Amos, condemns the nation of Israel and calls them back to faithfulness. And in fact, he sues them for divorce. He says, these are the reasons, these are the the points that I have against you. In the book of Hosea, another Old Testament prophet, Hosea is commanded to marry a woman who would undoubtedly be unfaithful. In fact, she was a prostitute. And then God uses that marriage as an image of Israel's unfaithfulness to their husband, God. And might I say also of God's steadfast love and faithfulness to Israel. In the New Testament, Jesus uses this betrothal and marriage language regarding our relationship with him in very significant ways, but it's sometimes lost on us. So the main portion of this this sermon is relating Old Testament marriage customs to what we read in the Bible. Now, I'm really excited about what we're going to see. Because I think when we see what Jesus is saying in the New Testament, it's lost on us today. 
We don't realize what it is that Jesus is actually doing when he comes here on earth, lives a perfect life, and dies in our place. So to better understand this, let's talk just a brief minute about Jewish wedding customs. This is from the books called the Mishnah and the Talmud. The Mishnah and the Talmud, Mishnah came first, Talmud came second. These are essentially commentaries on the Old Testament. So where the Old Testament would say something like, um, you, shall not see, you shall not boil a kid in the milk of its mother. You shall not cook a goat in the milk of the mother of that goat. Well, what does that mean? Jewish rabbis would get together and they would begin to discuss, well, what does it mean to really do? And they come away with all of these regulations that would uphold that single verse. And today we see it even today in Israel. You go to Israel, you're never going to be served dairy products with meat products. They're separate. They're always separate. And it comes from that particular verse. So let's talk about, in those commentaries, what it says about Jewish wedding customs. First, a man sets his eye on his beloved. He's walking through the town. He sees a woman that he likes or he hears about her. He sees how she interacts, and he wants to make her his wife. He is the initiator in this. I would say it's all you men who need to hear this, but the men who need to hear it are at home sleeping or playing video games, okay? The man takes the initiative. He sets his eye on his beloved. With his father's blessing, then, he leaves his home and goes to the house of the woman he loves. He approaches the family, specifically the father of the woman he seeks to marry. The man and the woman's father agree on the marriage. And they say, this is a good idea. And they agree on a dowry. In other words, is a bride price. The Hebrew word is mahar, a purchase price. They agree on the mahar. Now, before you say that women were just chattel, not cattle, chattel, property, okay, that were to be bought and sold, you need to understand. There were real economic risks and economic impact of having someone leave a family or to have someone be added to a family. In that, in, that, in that culture, which undoubtedly was a patristic culture, men were in charge, there's no doubt. It was a very man-centric culture. You can read it throughout the scripture. There's no doubt about that. But in that culture, when someone in the family left, okay, that meant that there was economic downfall And so to make up for that economic downfall, there would be something of a dowry paid, a bride price. On the other hand, someone being added to a family would cause an economic windfall. And that economic windfall would then be offset by someone paying the family of the person losing the wife. Does that make sense? I don't know if that makes it any better, but that's how it went. What's interesting, though, is that the price of the dowry, the bride price, was known to the woman before she accepted So she was able to understand her value in the eyes of her potential husband before she agreed to be wedded to him, before she agreed to be betrothed. There's something beautiful in that. You know, think about someone coming to ask for your hand in marriage and there was a bride price or a payment that came with it and the person said, I'll give you a hundred bucks. Now imagine coming, I'll give you a hundred thousand. How special are we? We're going to see what the bride price was that Christ gave on our behalf. And we know what that value is. And when we see what he had to do in order to get us, to ransom us, not only do we see the severity of sin, but we see our value as his beloved, our value. And the woman had to agree. There was not a coercion, or maybe coercion is too strong. I'm sure there was probably some coercion. But the woman had to agree. She did not get betrothed against her will. There had to be an acceptance of the offer. With acceptance by the woman, a covenant was cut between the father, the son, and the bride. Sound familiar? They would seal their marriage by both drinking from a cup of wine, starting a new covenant. Betrothal, like I said, was a legally binding covenant. For all intents and purposes, they were married, and all the right and authority given to the husband was then transferred to the bride in that moment. Does that sound familiar? Matthew 28, all authority on earth and in heaven has been given unto me, therefore go. Perhaps you already see the parallels. So let me explain them a little more 
specifically. Jesus set his eye upon us. From eternity past, he has known who we would be, that we were his beloved, that he would come to die for us, to be ransomed, to ransom us by his own blood. Ephesians 1, 3, and 5 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ in every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as, listen to this, he chose us and in him before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. Sometimes when I'm talking to someone about the Lord, or maybe they're not a believer, and, they're, and as we're discussing it, and I'm saying, do you, do you understand what I'm talking about? Does this make sense? They start saying, oh, I get it. I get it. I start to see a wash come over them. And I can't help but think about I'm witnessing in real time something that was ordained in eternity past. Think about that. The fact that you're a child of the king, the fact that you're a child of God was ordained for ever. That Jesus has always had his eye on you. That he knew who we would be. That he would ransom a people for himself. That he would one day have a bride of those who he's loved forever. The next series we're going to do is actually on love. Well, we're going to talk about love in all of its facets, and many of its facets. We're going to talk about God's love and who God is as a lover and who we are as a lover of God and most importantly, perhaps, how we love those around us because that's the evidence that we really and truly have embraced the love of who God is. I'm excited for this because, little side thing, I'm excited for this because we spend a lot of time talking about, which is true, that God loves because that's who God is. We need to talk a little more about God loves because he loves you and you're special and he wants you. We don't talk about that stuff enough. Jesus left his abode, his father's house, to establish a marriage covenant with us. Galatians 4.4 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. In John 1.14, it says, The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. The second person of the Trinity was born into humanity as a baby, as Jesus Christ, and died on our behalf to strike a covenant with us, to be engaged to us, and to one day bring us to him in a heavenly matrimony. And of course, probably most obviously, Jesus paid the bride price. 1 Corinthians 6 specifically says, you were bought with the price. You are not your own. He bought us with his very blood. With his very blood. Today, as we do communion, we're going to take some time, and we're going to really sit and consider the fact that Christ died for us. We're going to remember what he paid on our behalf not just for the sin, which is true, but because we were valuable. And we're going to take some time and we're going to consider what that means for our life today. How do we live differently knowing that our husband has paid for us with his very life? Revelation 5, 9 says, And they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed, a pe you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God and they shall reign on earth. Jesus establishes a covenant with us. This covenant that he proposed, we call it the new covenant, foreshadowed in the Old Testament and consummated and made real in the new, it's a promise, a new way of interacting. The new covenant says that I'm going to do everything for you because you cannot. All you have to do in response is believe, is believe. Everything that we do in our life, thinking that we're appeasing God, thinking that somehow God's going to love us more, can be set aside because Jesus did it all. We simply embrace it by faith. We agree. Just as the bride agreed to the betrothal, we agree with ours. 
And finally, the covenant is sealed by sharing a cup of wine. We're going to do that in communion. We're going to consider when we take these elements, when we drink this juice, what does this mean? This is us accepting a proposal. It's us saying, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> so what else does the mission of the Talmud say about Jewish wedding customs? Well, after that all happened, after the co- covenant was made, after there was an agreement by the bride, after they sealed it with the cup, the man would go back to his father's house. He would prepare a room attached or adjacent to the father's. And he would begin to prepare a place for his bride. Interestingly, it could be a, a long time, as long as a year. The, the betrothed, the husband, preparing the place so that on their wedding day, they would have a place to dwell forever. Now, it's so interesting. When the man would retrieve, his bride was unknown to the man. So when Jesus said, I don't know, no man knows, not even the son, he was speaking the truth. We chalk it up and say, well, it was in his humanity that he didn't know, and he limited himself to his under... If you look at the custom, the son didn't know. It was the prerogative of the father. The father would come in, he would look at the place prepared, and he would say, son, I think today is the day. There's even evidence in the Talmud and Mishnah that this would happen in the middle of the night sometimes. So when we read, be ready, have your lamps lit, be filled with oil, you don't know, like a thief in the night I come. Jesus is speaking truth that he knows not when he will appear, that the Father will tell him now. And one day he will come for us, his bride. Second point, our betrothed has gone to prepare a place for us. John 14, 1, 3. Listen to what Jesus tells his disciples. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that where, with me that you also may be where I am. Jesus, after his death and his ascension, returned to heaven, is there reigning on high, preparing a place for us. Some translations say, in my father's house are many mansions. I don't need a mansion. I do not need a mansion. Let me go to heaven. I'll live in a janitor's closet. I will live wherever you, I can get really tiny. I'll get really tiny. Just let me go. The day of his return is unknown. But when the father gives the green light, it's go time. You ever think about your room in heaven? What is it going to be like? What does it mean? I know it's a metaphor, but think about that. It's like, When you get to heaven, it's going to be, when we get there, we're suddenly going to arrive and feel, this is where I've belonged. All of my yearning and longing on earth and a desire to seek that thing. You know what I'm talking about? Just that thing that makes everything okay. I'm standing finally in that place in the presence of God and everything is fine in my life forever. Long for that day. I long for it and I know you do too. Because I look at what we prioritize in our life. I look at to which we turn our eyes and our hearts to try to fill that peace. And rarely is it God. And it's subtle. Part of our fallen nature is that we're always looking for that thing. And never being satisfied because we were made to never be satisfied, we will finally find our satisfaction in the one who gives forever and infinitely. So let's turn to the final stage of the Jewish wedding customs. So once the father gave the green light and said, today's the day, go get your bride, he would gather all of his friends. And he would say, my father said, today's the day. And they would be walking through the streets to the house of his beloved, making noise, and when they got outside, guess what he would do? Shout! Just like the scripture says, the groom would take his bride back to his father's house where there would be a long celebration inaugurating the start of their marriage proper, the wedding feast. When we look to the scripture, we see this. This is number three, the day, one day our betrothed will appear and take us home to be with him forever. In the scripture, it says Jesus returns with the shout of an archangel. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven. 
His father just told him, today's the day, go get your bride. The Lord will come down from heaven with a loud command, the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. That as hard as life is here, that is difficult and painful and sad. And yes, there's joy. But let's not be confused. Life is hard. Life is hard. That one day we can look to the end and know that everything will be made right. So those injustices that we suffer, those times when people in our lives get one over on us, those times when we believe that we should have had it another way, a better way, but it didn't work out, those times we get sick and we weren't healed. All of it, all of it will be made right one day when our husband returns to bring us to himself forever, forever. This is called the rapture. In fact, the word rapture comes out of this passage. It says, and we will be caught up. That caught up word in Latin is rapterio. It's a word that we get the English word rapture from. That one day, Christ will appear and we will go to him. We will go to him. Revelation 19, 6, 8 says that there's going to be a a feast, a festival, a celebration like none other. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of a mighty peal of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory for the marriage of of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. When we stand before God, because of what Christ has done, we stand perfect and pure before him, and our deeds, the good, the We talked about it not that long ago. The good things that we do out of the right heart will clothe us and we will shine as children of light. So what does this beautiful and sublime vision mean for us today? We got to be ready. Number four, we are ready. We are to be ready for the return of our betrothed. We cannot get caught unexpectedly, unexpectedly. We must live another way. We must live with our wedding day in mind. Lane and I were engaged. You're going to tell me the exact time I'm going to get it wrong. How long were we engaged for? 18 months, right? 18 months, okay. 18 months we were engaged. 18 months is a long time. You guys know what I'm talking about. It's a long time. And in the beginning, it was like, we got this. We got this. We're going we're gonna to do this well. I remember coming out of prison and saying, I need to live differently than the people around me, and I was fully committed to living differently. Lane had worked in youth ministry for so long, talking, talking about remaining pure for her husband and all of this. There was a lot to lose here. I mean, of course, sinning against the Lord, all that, the utmost importance, obviously, but we did not want to be hypocrites. We did not. And we knew you stinkers were watching. (laughs) So in the beginning, it was good. We started strong. But then you get into the doldrums of an engagement. And it's like, oh my goodness, how much longer is it going to be? The thing that kept us going was our wedding day. And as it got closer, it got easier. It was like, oh yeah, we only got three months. We can do this. We got this. Looking at the end and the promise of what would occur is what kept us strong. And this is exactly what the Bible is telling us today. That when we live with our eyes on that day, when everything will be made right, when we live with our eyes on the day that Christ will return, our husband, and we do not want to be stained and sullied by the things of this world, we've been given grace and energy and motivation to continue moving forward. Then the next day we wake up and we forget it and we remind ourselves again and we do the same thing until we get to that moment. 
We don't know when that moment will be. But we need to anticipate his return, anticipate our togetherness with the Lord with joy. I know sometimes we want to talk about like the book of Revelation, we want to talk about end time stuff, and there are times when this idea, when I speak to people about the end times, brings fear. Brings fear. They read about the great tribulation and they worry about what's going to happen to them or to their loved ones, and rightly so. Get out there, guys. But always in the scripture does the end time, the return of Christ, portrayed for believers in joyous terms. Joy. So we need to look to that day, knowing that one day our husband will come back. And we need to be ready. We need to fight distraction. It's so distracting here. So distracting. We will get off into the weeds in absolutely no time. And for me, I don't know about you, I always like wake up one day and I'm like, how did I get here? I'm way off track because I'm just following my belly. All of us have an insatiable desire for more that can only be filled by one thing, one person, Christ. And so we in this world must walk and fight the distractions that are surely to come, surely to come. Now, I don't know what those distractions are for you. For me, social media is a good one. TV is a good one. Worry is a good one. Relationships with people who don't want to be helped is a good one. There are a million ways to be distracted, and you know yours. And God knows that you know that he knows that you know yours. <laughs> so just admit it. Tell him. And he'll give you the strength to keep your eyes on Christ again and again. Lest we be distracted when he returns. Think about this. How do you want to be found? We come here every week. Right, guys? Every week? Come here every week. And once a month, we take communion together and we commemorate the life and death of our Savior, the one who died, paid everything, everything, so we could have eternal life. Think about that word. I want everyone to say it with me. Eternal. Ready? Go. Eternal. How long is that? Forever. Yeah, forever. Forever. Wow, I just made you guys all say it at the same time and you just got nervous and all shuffled in your seats like... It's okay, we can have a conversation like this. Forever. He's done so much, he's given so much. Each day he gives us grace and love and forgiveness. Every single good thing you have in your life, him. Don't get it confused. It's not your talent. It's not your career choices. It's not luck. It's not your church attendance. It's not how much Bible study you do nothing. It's every good thing comes from the Father of lights. Everything comes from God. So if he's given us everything here on earth and then for eternity in heaven, how do you want to be when you stand in front of him? I know that when I get there, the Bible says that because of what Christ has done on my behalf, I will be, it'll as if I'm sinless before him. Because the truth is, is that's how God looks at us now. I'll be sinless before him. And he'll say, come. Come. Because of your belief in my son who died. If it's Christ speaking, come because of what I did for you. But I'll know. (laughs) I'll know. Every time I messed up, Every time I chose to go my way instead of his. Every time I wanted something more for myself than I knew God wanted for me. I'll know. On the one hand, that will exalt God. Christ. The gap that's been bridged by Christ is so much further than we think. So much further. But in the end, I want to be found ready. I want to be found ready. So we must keep ourselves pure. That means we fight the idolatry in our lives. And 
all of us, all of us are idolaters. We all have this penchant in our heart to worship something other than the one true God. And we need to get honest about what some of these things are. Like there's, not, there's obviously the big ones. You know what I mean? Like we list our, our sins. You know what I mean? And then we say, well, I'm not as bad as that person. But we need to be honest about the serious, the gravity of worshiping yourself instead of worshiping the one true God, of worshiping money, of reputation. It's important for us to get honest about these things so that we can remain pure. We can look to Christ, to the grace that we need to remain faithful to him. Now, you guys remember the show Cheaters? No, no one ever watched it. It's a terrible show, man. It's a terrible show. It was basically just getting caught. It was getting caught cheating on your loved one, whoever it was, husband, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever. Private investigators. They'd like follow them around, record phone calls. It was like this sort of Jerry Springer-esque kind of feel to it and all of that. And then you'd hear the excuses of someone getting caught. And it was cringy, man. Cringy. What if Christ appears one day with his heavenly camera crew and you get caught? Do you want that? What excuse are you going to give? We have none. All we have is the honest truth that we like to feed our bellies more than we like to follow God. Each day is a fight. Each day is a fight. We need to remain faithful. We need to remain faithful. So, four points from today. The church is betrothed to Christ. He is our husband. Our betrothed has gone to prepare a place for us. That's where Jesus is now. Three, one day he will return. We'll be with him forever. And four, therefore we need to be ready. We need to be ready. Today's our Communion Sunday, and so we're going to partake together. I want to do it just a little bit differently, uh, maybe, than we have. Each week probably feels different, but that's okay. On the last day, on the Last Supper, Jesus was here on earth before his crucifixion, before he was turned over. He celebrated a Passover Seder with his people, with his disciples. And what he's doing when you're listening, when you understand what we talked about today, and you see them sitting there, You hear his words as he's proposing to them. He's proposing to them. Don't open your your stuff yet. I can hear it. You're going to be holding it for a minute. He's proposing to them. First, he lifts the bread. He breaks it. He gives it to them. He says, this is my body given for you. Take and eat. Then he lifts the cup of the wine, the cup of the new covenant. The cup sealing, the betrothal of his bride to himself. He says, this is the mohar, the bride price, my blood. He says, every time you drink this, remember me. And that you are bought with a price. And that you are not your own. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for the elements. Then we're going to sit. We're going to have a moment of special music. All right, And I really want you to reflect on... The fact that you, that we are the bride of Christ, that we're called to lives of faithfulness, that he's gone to prepare a place in perfection for us and one day we will be there and we must be ready. And ask the Lord to show you those areas of your life that need to go, that need to go. Ask him to show you how, how to live differently and to give you the grace to do it in accordance with his will. After that, after the song, we'll get up and we'll take communion together, together as the church, and then we'll finish our worship service together, all right? So let's take a moment and let's thank God for these elements. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your unbelievable, indescribable love for us, a love that moved you to sacrifice your son, your son from eternity, that we might be together with him forever. I pray, Lord, that you would bless this time. May your presence be here in our hearts, that we would feel it and realize it and reckon it, Lord. 
We pray, Lord, that you would bless this bread and this juice. And Lord, as we take it together after the song, we pray that you would make the life and death of your son Christ again real to us, driving home his great love. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us this day. In Jesus' name, amen.
the mahar, the bride price, the payment for our sins, the body of Christ, take and eat. Likewise, the, the price for our sin and the value of his great love for us, his blood, take and drink. You guys can feel free to stand as you feel led.
accused nor will he harbor his anger forever he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our inequities for as high as the heavens are above the earth so great is his love for those who fear him as far as the east is from the west so far he has removed our transgressions from us as a father has compassion on his children so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him
years of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment, his life was the cost. We stood neath the debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many, his mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more Stronger than darkness New every morn Our sins, they are many His mercy is more Our sins, they are many His mercy is Let's do that every week. <laughs> Let's do that every week. Next week, I will not be with you. We talked about uh, Pastor Wayne's going to come up and deliver a message on the flock, another one of the metaphors of the church, and so we're excited for that. I, unfortunately, will be doing my duty and going to be in France with my beloved wife. Come on up. And with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Keel. Dan, if you would come up. Mrs. Keel is in... Uh, children's kingdom kids right now teaching so we're grateful for that and i'm going to invite tom up uh the chairperson of our mission board and we're going to ask tom to bless us as we go commission us on our way so we appreciate that i'd like to give you some context grace bible church has supported missionaries since its existence and you might wonder why Remember that verse that was on the screen that talked about voices from every tribe, mm. every language? And remember the verse that says, how will they believe unless somebody tells them and who will tell them unless they're sent? Well, you and I are sent to our friends, our families, our neighbors, but who will tell those in countries where there are hardly any Christians at all. Now, you might think France is a Christian country. But Christianity there is a building with very few people many times. And many of the people there don't know the Lord. Dan and Margaret were called to go to France to build a church. One of the churches they built was San Lee. How many years were you there? About 20 years. Yep. 20 years in building a church that is a thriving church today. They came back after that and, and their heart was troubled because they had family concerns. And they knew if they went back to France at their age, 20 years to build a church. But the Lord led them to go back. And they went to the city of Nyon, the birthplace of John Calvin. And the Lord did a mighty work because that church began to grow and flourish. We as a congregation have been part of that. Every once in a while, we have contributed to their growth, their building their support. But that's money. This time, as that church is ready to open the facility that they've labored long and hard to bring to fruition, our pastor and his wife, Dan and Margaret, are going back to encourage and, and give them support in a very personal and loving way. That's so important, and that's why they're going. So let's pray for them as they're there, because this is a people that you will one day stand with every tongue, 
every tribe. And you will have a part in the building of that church. And that is a wonderful thing. So let's pray for them as they go. Father, we thank you for the work that you've accomplished in Nyon in building your church. And we pray, Lord, as Dan and Margaret and, and, and Pastor Adam and Elaine, as they go to celebrate, to encourage, uh, to show a personal love for the people of Nyon, that you would bless them in that travel, in every word that's said, whether it's in English or in French, help the translations to be well done so that all can be blessed and you can be glorified in the establishment of this church. Pray for journey mercies, but more importantly, we pray that our love for them and their love for us might be clear as brothers and sisters in Christ. Mm -hmm. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Tom. I forgot to have you sit. I'm sorry. One last thing. Out here next to the office door, there are paintings that Melanie Peters has done every week coinciding with... That's right. We're clapping for the Lord that coincided with each one of the messages in this series. So stop and take a look. They're awesome. They're so awesome. So all right. Don't sit down, go ahead and stand. I should have had you sit before. Let's, let me bless you guys. Father, I pray that you would be with my brothers and sisters as they go. I pray, Lord, that you would give them joy and remember that you're returning. I pray, Jesus, that you, when you come, would find us ready, faithful, and so excited to go. Be where you are, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Go in peace.